Good evening. Welcome to this first Lou Douglas lecture for this school year. Uh, I'm Linda Teener. I'm the executive director at UFM Community Learning Center, who's the sponsor of this lecture series. Our series is named for Lou Douglas, who was a, a distinguished professor of political science at Kansas State University from 1949 to 1977. Lou was widely known for his power to be able to inspire students, faculty, and the community to instigate change and to motivate thinking in a broader way. Uh, he was very interested in grassroots efforts, and he worked closely with a number of grassroots organizations and individuals interested in expanding opportunities in our state, in our nation, and in our world. Uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, we'll have the lecture, and as soon as the lecture's over, we'll open it for questions and, answer, uh, questions and answers, which is a, a special feature of our series. We ask that you please come down to the mic to ask your question, and then you can go sit down. But we'd like to be able to capture the question so that everyone can hear it. So please do come to the mic to ask your question, and our speaker will be glad to answer. Um, she also will be available for a few minutes following the lecture if you would like to stay and visit with her individually. If you have to leave at the end of the lecture, please do so quietly so people can begin gathering and asking the questions and everyone can hear. So at this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Betsy Cobble. She's an associate professor of sociology, anthropology, and social work, and also the head of that department, who's going to take the time to introduce our speaker for the evening. Betsy? Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Hi, it's nice to see you all here so soon after school started. Uh, you don't look quite as tired as you do at the end of the semester, so that's exciting. I hope you're having an exciting time. I am truly delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker this evening, Commissioner Sandy Prager. Um, I want to emphasize what Linda said about the question and answer period and encourage you to stay for that because you really never know what happens and sometimes that's absolutely the best part of our presentations. Um, a public servant like Commissioner Prager is truly hard to find. She's held public office in Kansas since 1985. She was on the Lawrence City Commission uh, for four years, and during that period of time, she was mayor of Lawrence, Kansas. We'll, for, we'll forgive her for that for tonight. She was a Kansas State legislator, a Kansas State senator, served in our legislature for uh, elected three times to the Senate and has been our 24th Commissioner of Insurance and elected to that office three times. I, I kind of think she's probably at this point won more elections than Obama. I'm thinking you may have. You have. Um, but more impressive than just winning elections is what Commissioner Prager has been able to accomplish. She is responsible in her position as Commissioner of Insurance for regulating all insurance sold in Kansas and overseeing nearly 1,700 insurance companies and more than 100,000 agents licensed to do business in the state. While in the legislature, she worked to gain passage of patient protection laws, which protects all of us, external review of health plans and insurance, and the Kansas expansion of children's health insurance. In 2001, she led a successful campaign for mental health parity in Kansas. This was such an important moment in our history of beginning to deal responsibly and with respect for people who suffer from mental illnesses. Commissioner Prager, as you can well imagine, has been recognized for her work. Her colleagues elected her president of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. She's a two-time recipient of the prestigious Dr. Nathan B. Davis Award, which is bestowed annually by the American Medical Association to individuals who've made a significant contribution to the public health through elected and career government service. In 1997, the Kansas Association for the Medically Underserved recognized her leadership on healthcare access issues. She was recognized by the Center 
for population options for the legislation she sponsored in 1994 to create teen pregnancy prevention programs in Kansas. As you can see, she spent much of her career working on access to health care for everyone. In addition, Throughout this time, she's continued to be involved in her community, and that includes being the, on the board of directors of the United Way of Douglas County. She's a founding member of three local boards, the Healthcare Access, a clinic, a clinic for the medically in, indigent, and in, in, I started to say indignant, that's not what I mean, for people who can't afford medical care. The Haskell Indian Nations University Foundation and CASA, which is Court Appointed Special Advocates. During your time at K-State, some of you may volunteer for that program. A number of our students do. Because it's an organization dedicated to helping children who come under the jurisdiction of the court. I hope we all aspire to provide the kind of service that Commissioner Prager has role modeled for us. Let's please welcome her with a K-State welcome. Well, thank you, Wildcats, for welcoming this Jayhawk uh, into your fold. I really appreciate it. Before I start, I want to mention a, um, a couple of people that are um, here that um, my assistant, personal assistant, Karen Ripple, who is a K-State graduate, uh, Zach Anschutz, who is our assistant commissioner, and Tom Whalen, who is not just a did you graduate from K-State? No. But he lives in Manhattan, and he drives back and forth from Manhattan to Topeka every day, every day and, and is the head of our agent licensing division in the department. And uh, so three really uh, great people that do a lot to help us um, keep the lights on every day. But another really special person, special personally to me, uh, is my son's mother-in-law, Annette Edwards Huff, who is here with uh, a good friend of hers from college, and um, Annette's um, grandfather, Severin's grandfather, Annette's father was Thornton Edwards, who Edwards Hall is named for. And, and so um, I can tell you, when I was west of 81 campaigning, I talked a lot about those wildcat connections in, in the family. <laughs> so thanks for being here, Annette and, and Marlis. Um, let me start off by just talking a little bit about um, why the Affordable Care Act was necessary. Why did it, why did it pass? Um, it's been a long, arduous journey to get to a point where we finally have a law in our country that says everybody needs to have access to health care services and the means to pay for it. Um, if we look back, um, the um, well, AMA started in the early 1900s, and Teddy Roosevelt and the Progressive Party um, tried to get started, he campaigned on a promise to bring uh, universal health care and, and a requirement that people have health care. And then it got derailed by World War I. Um, in the late 20s, uh, Baylor University uh, Hospital in Dallas offered a plan to local teachers for 50 cents per member per month. And um, that became the very first health insurance program. And that was back in the 20s. And that was the very first Blue Cross plan. And um, then we know the Social Security Act passed in 1934, but insurance, health insurance was not included in it. And, and the AMA opposed it, um, partly because um, they didn't want an insurance company getting, in the, getting between them and their patient. And actually, doctor's visits weren't as expensive as they are today. Hospitals didn't cost what they cost today. So um, it was... Um, I think, a, an understandable position for them to take. Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, tried to promote compulsory national health insurance. Later, Truman tried to propose national health insurance, um, but it was re rejected as um, an attempt to socialize medicine. And then World War II broke out, and, um, and uh, th that effort sort of was derailed. After World War II, it was interesting because there were caps on wages. And one way that employers could attract uh, new employees to their business was to offer them benefits. And one of the benefits was health insurance. And um, Congress uh, went along with it and made those health insurance benefits 
uh, non-taxable, pre-tax dollars. So you could continue to, you could add health benefits and, and it wouldn't be considered income to the individual. And, and the employer could provide health benefits and it could be done with pre-tax dollars for the employer. So that sort of fueled then the development of, of health insurance and, and an employer-based system as, as we know it today. Uh, most other industrialized nations, they might have some employer um, portion to their insurance, but most other industrialized nations use um, a, a tax structure, and it's, it is much more of a, a top-down. Um, the Affordable Care Act is really just the opposite, building on that private insurance marketplace. So um, by 1953, 63% of the U.S. population was covered by employer-based um, health insurance in a really very short period of time. I mean, health insurance, even though that plan started back in the 20s, it really did not gain prominence as uh, an employer benefit until after uh, World War II, and partly because of those, uh, the tax benefits. And then in 1965, Medicare and Medicaid uh, became law, uh, and in uh, a little bit later, uh, when Richard Nixon was president in 1972, the um, Health Maintenance Organization uh, Act was passed. It, it was called the Roy Rogers Bill, not because of the old cowboy star from way back, but because uh, one of the sponsors was Bill Roy, a Kansan, who was serving in Congress at the time and also was a physician, is a physician, and uh, he was uh, one of the sponsors. There were plans to expand beyond that to get more of a national um, system of uh, insurance, but y'all, if you study your history, you know uh, poor President Nixon got into a little bit of trouble called Watergate, and, and uh, that pretty much derailed uh, any effort at that point to um, provide additional coverage. Um, healthcare entities, uh, corporations, um, started to consolidate um, privatization of healthcare facilities as well as um, these insurance companies grew and um, it, it became a really important part of the U.S. economy. These, not just uh, the healthcare delivery system but the, but the means of paying for it through, uh, through ins private insurance. Um, in 87, the Census Bureau estimated that 31 million in the U.S. Uh, were uninsured, about 13% of the population. And unfortunately, that number just continues to rise. And uh, we think the, the number of uninsured now is, is uh, well over 50 million and will continue to go up if, if, uh, if something isn't done. And hopefully that something will be um, at least reasonable, successful uh, implementation of the Affordable uh, Care Act. It's not going to be without its glitches, and I think we all are sort of holding our breath because, uh, like it or not, our departments across the country, insurance departments are, across the country, are going to be um, heavily involved in regulating the Affordable Care Act. Insurance has traditionally been regulated at the state level. Our department was founded in 1871, and nothing in the law takes away the ability of state regulators to regulate the insurance plans. Um, so. Uh, and that's a good thing because I think you'd much rather be calling our department when you have trouble getting a claim paid than having to call a 1-800 number in the federal bureaucracy and hope to heck you finally get somebody that actually you can talk to that can perhaps even attempt to answer your question. So in 2010, well in 2006, let me just uh, back up, Massachusetts became the first state to mandate health insurance coverage for its citizens. It has the lowest uninsured rate now. That's Romney Care. It has the lowest uninsured rate at less than 5%. And it appears, based on polls, that it's a pretty popular plan with folks. Now, costs are escalating faster than anticipated, and they're having to look at ways to bring health care costs under control. Because I always tell people, when when your insurance premium's going up, it's just the mes messenger telling you that health care costs are going up. The premium is, is just an indicator of, of what's happening with health care costs. So, in 2010, Congress, in uh, March of 2010, uh, passed the Pata Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act uh, that does require um, all U.S. citizens, or nearly all U.S. citizens, there are some exceptions, uh, to have health 
insurance beginning in 2014. And that's what we're getting ready for as we speak. The law had some early provisions that um, were enacted and, and are already in place. But the real, the real big changes do come in 2014. So exchanges open next month, um, October 1st. Uh, we're calling them marketplaces now. I wish they'd just find a label that they liked and stick with it. But exchanges became confusing because there are other kinds of exchanges out there. So it's hard for me to remember to say marketplace, but that's what they are. And they're trying to draw the uh, comparison between other shopping that you do on the Internet. This is Internet-based. So some of the early provisions uh, are already in place, as I said. But in 2014, probably the most important provision, which really is going to dramatically change the way private insurance companies sell their products, and that's to the, when we eliminate um, the pre-existing condition exclusions. It's always seemed a little odd to me that the people who need it most probably can't buy it if they're going out into the individual market because they've been sick. So that goes away. Insurance companies can no longer tell you you can't buy insurance, and they can't charge you more based on your health status. So that's a good thing, but as you might imagine, the insurance companies are saying, yeah, but if you don't tell people they have to buy it, then why wouldn't they just wait until they're sick and we can't deny them coverage, so that doesn't work. And so the only people buying them would be people that, that are sick, so that's why um, you have to tell folks they need to buy before they get sick. Uh, guaranteed issue and renewability of coverage means you, you can't be dropped from coverage just because you start using your, your health care services. And we know that happens uh, and did happen, and those were some of, you know, things that laws get passed uh, oftentimes uh, based on anecdotes, and uh, members of Congress are, heard a lot of those anecdotal stories about people uh, being dropped from coverage after having been paying premiums all those years, and then all of a sudden, let's say it's a woman with breast cancer and she starts getting uh, expensive treatments. Uh, there was a case that gained some prominence during the time the, bill was being, the uh, bills in Congress were being debated. Uh, a woman getting treatment for her breast cancer who got dropped from coverage because the company did what we call post-claims underwriting. They go back to look at the person's application to see if they can find fault with it. And in her case, she hadn't told them she'd been treated for acne as a teenager. Now, what does that have to do with her breast cancer? Nothing. But that was a reason for them to be able to drop her from coverage. So the new law also puts the threshold pretty high, and you, can't, um, you cannot non-renew and you can't drop from coverage unless you prove that somebody intentionally lied about something um, on, their, on their application. There are rating factors, so you can't be rated more based on your health status, but you can be based on age, and this is going to be something I want to talk about a little bit about because uh, for young people, there is concern that the age rating is perhaps going to um, make insurance uh, more costly. Um, the three to one age band means that older folks can't be charged more than three times what younger folks are charged, or the other way of thinking about it, younger folks can't be charged less than a third of what older folks are charged. So as the older population gets sicker and you're, you've got these age bands, it just brings everybody up. So um, that's going to be a problem. And in fact, if I were to find fault with the law, that's maybe one of the, one of the provisions that we continue through our National Association of Insurance Commissioners to say, you know, if there was some way you could fix that to at least start with a broader ban so we don't drive younger folks out of the market, even though there's a mandate that you buy, the penalties are, are fairly low. And we want, we want everyone buying. We want everybody in the pool because that's what's going to help keep, keep the cost down for everybody. So, you, but you can't tell people they have to buy unless you, if it's, if it's unaffordable. So there are tax credits and subsidies um, that are available. Let me go back because I, I mentioned the, um, the three to one age rating. There are three other rating factors. Tobacco use, you can be charged one and a half times, 1.5% more. 
uh, so 50% more for tobacco use. Geography, in, uh, so some parts of the state, it costs more to deliver health care than in other parts, and family structure. If you, obviously, a family with kids, it's going to, your premium would be greater than a, than a single person. Um, tax credits, then, are available up to 400% of the federal poverty level. And um, so for a family of four, that's over $94,000 annual income. So some fairly significant um, subsidies that are tax credits and subsidies for lower income folks to help with some of the out-of-pocket expense. And then there are limits on out-of-pocket costs in the qualified health plans, um, 6,300 for individuals, so when you, and um, 12,700 for families. When you reach that out-of-pocket limit, then everything, all of the health care needs that you have would be paid for by the, by the health insurance that, that you've purchased. The um, mandated coverage is for essential health benefits. And the law didn't describe what the essential health benefits would be. It, they left that up to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Do you all know who that is? Our former governor, Kathleen Sebelius. They left it up to her. Kathleen used to have my job. She started out, as the she started out in the legislature and then she was the insurance commissioner. So she understands um, insurance regulation. She knew to try to have a standard set of essential health benefits across the country would be very difficult to do. Every state has its own set of rules about what they think should be covered. And so instead of trying to get a one-size-fits-all in terms of uh, benefits, she very wisely said, we're going to let the states decide what they want their essential health benefit package to be within limits. There's 10, 10 categories. Let me see. I'll go back and we'll get to those in a sec. But there are 10 categories that they have to cover. But the state can decide how to, how to cover those based on their own state laws. Um, in Kansas, the essential health benefits are patterned after the uh, largest uh, small group plan enrollment-wise, uh, the largest uh, enrollment in, in the small group market, and that's the uh, Blue Cross um, Comprehensive Health Insurance um, Plan. So, the, um, so it doesn't change much in terms of what those essential health benefits are, but it does say that all plans at a minimum have to, have to offer at least that level of benefit. That's one of the ways to try to make the law, th that the law tries to make health insurance more equitable so that if you're getting employer-based coverage and your employer has a pretty skinny package but another employer has a pretty comprehensive rich set of benefits, in a sense um, that employer is penalized because uh, the other employer isn't offering much because that other employer's skinny set of benefits means that many times their employees are going to end up not being able to pay for their health care services because they're not covered and the rest of the insured population will pick it up, especially that employer that provides rich benefits. So this says, at a minimum, everybody needs to provide those essential health benefits, and, uh, and that it, it attempts to level the playing field that way. Uh, but again, there's an individual mandate that says um, consumers um, need to buy coverage so that you don't wait until you're sick uh, to buy it. And then we are, are establishing these uh, online marketplaces, as I said, we used to call them exchange, but now we're calling them marketplace. So um, this is a online web-based marketplace where uh, people will go to find out what, what the options are in their state, and and uh, each state uh, worked with insurance companies in their state. The states uh, approved the plans that would be sold on their state marketplace. And in states like Kansas, where we, are, we did not develop the uh, marketplace as a state-based exchange, as Congress wanted, the law says, we're, we're going to let the states run their own exchanges, their own marketplaces. Uh, 34 states opted out of setting up their own marketplace, and Kansas is one of them. So our marketplace will be run by the federal government, um, but we've had a close relationship with them during this implementation time 
to make sure that we can still be there for the consumers. We still got to approve the health plans before they uh, submitted their documentation to HHS. And HHS is in the process now of loading that into this federal exchange. Now think about it, a federal exchange being operated in 34 states, it's 34 different federal exchanges in those 34 states because every state was able to establish their own benefit structure based on their existing state laws. So it's not a one size fits all, even, even with the federal exchange in 34 states because uh, each one has to, com has to comply with the state rules in that state. So uh, it would, be, would have been much easier for us to do a state-based exchange, and I can't imagine what they're going through right now in Washington as they're trying to uh, get this ready to roll here in just a few weeks. Open enrollment starts October 1st. That's when people in Kansas will be able to see what the offerings are and will be able to see uh, potentially what kind of um, tax credit they might be eligible for. Um, initially, um, after the first year, the open enrollment will be from October 1st through uh, December 15th. The first year, it goes until March 31st because um, I think they anticipated it's just going to take a while. Um, I think people that are going to shop on the exchange would be smart to give it a few weeks, let them work some of those initial kinks out. But um, eventually, you'll want to check and see if, if it's something that you might be interested in to at least see what kind of financial assistance uh, might, might be available. The um, people in, in our states that are eligible for the Medicaid program or, or the Children's Health Insurance program can uh, enroll at any time during the year, but they also are linked to those programs through that um, state, that exchange, whether it's state or federal. So our, anyone eligible for Medicaid in Kansas would, would initially sign up by entering their basic uh, income information, and then they, if it's low enough, uh, they will be directed to, um, to the, the Medicaid program. Now, there, the law was challenged, as you know, and the, the two provisions in the law that the court ruled on, one was the individual mandate, and they said, this is the su Supreme Court, they said, it is constitutional. Congress does have the authority to, uh, to tax. So it's not a, for those people that decide not to buy insurance, there is a penalty, as I mentioned, and they're calling that penalty a tax, and that penalty tax Congress has the authority to do. So the individual mandate was declared constitutional, but the Medicaid expansion was determined to be coercive on the state. So the law said that we're going to expand Medicaid in all of the states up to 138% of the federal poverty level. And the states are all over the map on Medicaid eligibility. Kansas is one of the lowest. We're, I think, one of the five lowest in the country. Medicaid eligibility in Kansas is 32% of the federal poverty level. So that would have been a fairly significant expansion from 32%, which for um, a family of three is probably less than $6,000 a year. So it's very, very limited. So to get up to 138% would have been uh, a, a good expansion in spite of the fact that um, the court said it was coercive because it is a joint program. The first three years of Medicaid expansion is paid for through the federal law, so it's not state tax dollars, although federal tax dollars came from the states, as, as we all know. But it, uh, so, the, so the Medicaid expansion um, for the first three years would be 100% paid for by the, by the federal government and gradually phases down to a 60, uh, a 90-10 a, a match. We currently are at a 60-40 match. 60% 60 of the Medicaid costs are paid for by the federal government, 40% by the states. So the coercive na nature of it was that the states would al ultimately have to pay 10% of that additional cost, and that's what the court threw out. Well, that created a real problem because the law says um, for the exchanges that you go to to get uh, financial, find out if you are going to get any kind of a tax credit and financial assistance doesn't start until you're at 100% of the federal poverty level. So what happens to those folks between where we are now, and Kansas is not doing the Medicaid expansion, by the way, 
Uh, so between 32 percent of the federal poverty level and 100 percent of the federal poverty level, there's no assistance. And that's going to be kind of hard to explain to folks. You mean I'm too poor to qualify? You mean I make too much money? No. You don't make enough to be at 100 percent of the federal poverty level so that you can get on the exchange and get the financial assistance. And people between 100 and 200 percent of the federal poverty level won't have to pay much at all for good comprehensive insurance because the, uh, the tax credits will be significant enough. Um, and those tax credits are paid directly to the insurance company and they're paid in real time. So it isn't that you have to wait until the end of the year. You can if someone wants to get the tax credit at the end of the year to offset their, their tax liability, they can. But if they want it being paid directly to the insurance company to bring down the cost of their insurance, uh, it can be done um, the first month that, that they're eligible for coverage. And it's paid directly to, uh, to the insurance company. These are the essential health benefits that I was talking about. So they're um, things that any good health plan would have, hospitalization, doctor's visits, maternity and, maternity and newborn care, which is important, uh, mental health. Uh, we had to add a, a couple of things. Habilitative care was not in the Blue Cross plan, so it didn't, uh, that had to be added in, and uh, pediatric services, including oral and uh, dental and, and vision care for, for kids, had to be added in. But other than that, the essential health benefits that will be available on plans in Kansas are essentially the ones that have been out there in plans already. Um, plans sold to individuals as well as uh, to small employers um, both inside the exchange, so a company that wants to sell to folks uh, doesn't have to go on the exchange, but they still do have to, uh, they still do have to um, provide those essential health benefits. And um, the, um, so as I mentioned, that those 10, the 10 categories have already been um, approved and adopted in Kansas. Four levels of coverage, so when you go on the exchange, you're going to pick the bronze would be um, the uh, lower premium but higher out-of-pocket costs, so somebody who's healthy probably would pick the bronze plan because they don't think they're going to have many out-of-pocket expenses. Somebody who's not as healthy is going to pick that platinum plan where the premium is going to be more, uh, but your out-of-pocket expense would be, would be less. And then catastrophic, and this is what uh, young people need to be aware of. Uh, people under the age of 30 or eligible can buy, meet the, meet the requirement, buy a very high deductible uh, catastrophic plan, which will be very, uh, very cost effective, um, low cost, and still uh, meet the, ne the uh, necessary requirement. Um, the marketplace is going to be linked to a federal data hub, which will be able to give a real time evaluation. So you'll enter basic information about where you live, your zip code. Um, what your um, family's income is and proof that you're an American citizen, so you have a social security number, you would enter that, and they will verify citizenship through Homeland Security and the IRS will verify income and tell you in real time what kind of a uh, tax credit you'd be eligible for. The, um, as I mentioned, it's an internet-based website. It, some people are more savvy um, with the internet than others, and so uh, one of the, we want to make sure that people have numbers that they can call. The um, National Call Center is available. If you go to healthcare.gov, you can find out a lot of information about um, the National Call Center as well as um, be directed back to Kansas-specific information, or you can go to our website, and I'll have that information here in a sec. The, um, because it can be complicated and people may not be familiar with how to buy insurance, they may not be familiar with some of the terminology, what's a copay, what's a deductible, how do I figure out which plan's best for me. The program um, envisions navigators that can uh, assist in that, um, that sign-up process. And these are going to be trained, uh, in most cases, volunteers that will be overseen by uh, one of the three navigator programs that were selected um, to oversee the program here in Kansas. And uh, so hopefully, and I know extension agents are going to um, provide um, information. Um, the existing health insurance 
agency task force, the, the, the people that are already out there, and we've got a lot of agents out in, in Kansas that sell health insurance, those people can also use the exchange, and we anticipate that many of them will use this, ex this marketplace to um, show their customers a comparison from uh, the various the, the plans that are um, available to them. Um, HHS in Kansas, because we're not a federal exchange state, they were the ones that will, they selected the navigator entities and they'll, do, they'll oversee the training. Had we been a state exchange, we would have been selecting the navigators, the navigator programs and would have been in charge of the, of the training. But as I mentioned, licensed agents and brokers can also um, register and use the online marketplace to sell to their customers. Um, I'm not going to, this is the, the shop is the um, marketplace for small businesses. There's no requirement that small businesses provide health insurance. Businesses over 50 employees do have to provide coverage, but 95, 96% of them already do. And the mandate for them to provide coverage just got extended for another year because they don't have the technology set up yet to do all of the work that needs to be done. So, but small employers... Do, are not mandated to provide the coverage. If they want to just give their employees uh, X amount of dollars and tell their employees you can go to the exchange and buy coverage, that's fine. If they want to continue to buy coverage, uh, and they can use the exchange to let their uh, employees, the first year they can determine which plan they want their employees to buy, as they do now. After that, they can send their employees to the exchange and let them choose from uh, the array of, of, off of um, offerings. Uh, so the, the shop marketplace um, is still a, a work in progress and uh, I think will be more beneficial to small businesses as, as time goes on. Uh, I'm going to skip through some of that. The, um, as I said, agents can participate in the marketplace, but they must be licensed. And Tom Whalen is the person who will determine whether or not they're licensed and in good standing for the state of Kansas, and then if so, and if they remain licensed and, and in good standing, they can continue to use uh, the marketplace. We determine that, not HHS. So we, we retain the authority to regulate those agents, and that's really uh, important. So the challenges, oh my goodness, there are many, but uh, the short timeline, um, we hope uh, when the the switch gets uh, flipped on October 1st that actually people can go to these marketplaces and begin the enrollment process. I hope it goes as smoothly as Y2K. You remember the sky is falling predictions about Y2K, which never materialized when computers had to go from 1999 to 2000. Oh my gosh, how are they going to be able to figure what year it is? Um, everything was fine. I don't think it'll be quite as smooth as Y2K, but we can always hope because if it isn't, we're going to be getting the calls in our department. Um, are there enough community providers? There is a concern that maybe we won't have enough health care providers. To me, that's not a reason to not do this. We'll just figure out how to get more health care providers trained, and especially more allied health care providers. This, will be, this is a way of expanding, especially primary care, in a much more cost-effective way. Use AR and advanced registered nurse practitioners, use PAs, uh, use nurses. Uh, a, a doctor, a physician, doesn't have to do much of what uh, is done in terms of, of health care. It, it can be very cost effective, and I think this will be a real impetus for us to move into uh, more of this kind of a collaborative team approach for, um, for delivering health care. Um, the health care, this health care law, and as I mentioned at the outset, we've been a, a century uh, in uh, trying to, from from the, really the beginning of the 1900s to here we are, uh, 2013, uh, trying to find a method of delivering health care services and the method for those services to be paid for. This finally says there is a way, and it builds on a private insurance marketplace. It builds on private insurance that's already out there. Now, I can tell you that was very controversial because... <laughs> Did, did you all, were you all aware that the law is kind of controversial? Yeah. Well, it's controversial from both sides because the, the far left wanted it to be a single-payer system and I guess the far right didn't want to do anything. 
But uh, so it, it is controversial. The, the, um, it builds on, it keeps insurance companies at the table, and quite honestly, they do know how to manage care and, and how, to, uh, how to pay claims. So I don't see that as necessarily a bad thing. Um, but it does recognize that for many Americans, they haven't been able to buy the coverage, and that's wrong. People ought to be able to get access to health care, and you don't get access to health care unless you have a means to pay for it. What you get if you end up in an emergency room is not health care, that's sick care. And that's where people go that don't have any other way of, of getting access to services. People don't have a medical home if they don't have, if they don't have uh, health care health insurance, or some, or they're independently wealthy and can pay for the services whenever they need them. That's not very many. Healthcare can quickly bankrupt a family. It's the number one reason for filing personal bankruptcy in America. And I, that's, uh, that's unfortunate. Um, we're still going to be active in the regulation of, of these marketplaces. We're still going to be active in the regulation of the agents of the companies, and by the way, there are two, going to be two companies selling a variety of products on our exchange, Blue Cross Blue Shield and Coventry. Uh, we hope other companies will join um, after the first year, but for the first year we have, we have those two companies. Let me open it up now to your questions. I'd, I'd love to hear what's, what's on your mind. And as Linda said at the, at the outset, be sure to come down and, and uh, use the mics if you have a question. The clock is ticking on, on the opening, uh, opening day of these uh, health insurance exchanges uh, uh, across the country, and uh, I think we're all um, anticipating it, uh, maybe with a little bit of dread that it may all not go as smoothly as, smoothly as we would like it to, but at least know that um, to, to begin with, we're, um, we're finally have a system which we can build on that um, makes sure everyone has access to the health care services that they need. Yes, sir. It may seem a, uh, a pedestrian concern. Uh, any idea what these plans are going to cost? Um, the, let me, let me give you, here's one thing you can do. I, I, I should have mentioned our website. You can go, we've developed a new website at, at our department. It's called insureks.org. I believe, in fact, there it is. Um, you can go to that website. We have an estimator on the website. You can enter a county. You can enter a uh, family status. You can enter income, and it will feedback to you. So I, I'll give you one that, I, that um, we've, we've just played with in the department. A, uh, a couple in Washington County that makes $38,000 a year. The husband's 30, the wife is 28. They have two small children. Their premium before the tax credit would be about a little over $600 a month. After the tax credit, it's $145. So significant savings. Um, so you, and, and everybody, it's hard to give a, an across the board a because you've got four categories, the bronze, the silver, the gold, and the platinum level to choose from, and your family status is going to affect the, the, uh, the cost. But the, the, across the country, the dire predictions about the premiums being um, very unaffordable, I think, are proving uh, not to be the case as, as the um, companies file their uh, products. Eight, because we're a federal exchange state, we won't, we won't, none of our, the premiums won't be posted for Kansas until HHS posts them, and that's October 1. But you don't have to buy right away, so I, I re, we really encourage people to, if they're interested in buying insurance, go to the website, um, use one of the navigators or use a, an agent, and just see what, what the benefit might be. Good question. And everybody does need to understand what their potential cost would be. Yes? So my question is, if, since we have already a deficit in our national treasury budget, how are they going to pay all these tax credits that are supposed to reduce our premium? 
Well, um, the Congressional Budget Office scored the program. One of the things they're doing is bringing, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the premium is the messenger that health care costs are going up. One of the provisions in the law is the a creation of accountable care organizations, which moves health care delivery away from fee-for-service and towards a value-based system. Instead of doing more to get paid more volume, it, it, it rewards health plans for a, appropriate utilization of services. And when you, so that's, that's one category. Um, Medicare is, uh, the changes are being made to the companies that provide Medicare. There's no change in benefits for Medicare. In fact, the, the benefits for Medicare recipients have been enhanced. The donut hole, the so-called donut hole for prescription drug coverage, will close by 2020. Uh, primary care, one um, annual um, health care, primary care visit um, is, has been added, and a, and a number of other co-pays and deductible changes uh, that enhance the Medicare program. But when Medicare Advantage plans were first created, they, uh, they were being, uh, they thought, they wanted, they wanted private insurance companies to do this, to do these Medicare Advantage plans, and they enhanced their reimbursement 14% uh, above traditional Medicare, 14%. And they've done quite well. And um, so one of the savings is going to be to reduce that 14% ex that expenditure down. I don't know what the, what the, where the percentage ends up, but they're still going to get some enhancement. But um, and then overall just um, cost savings over the course of the 10 years that the Congressional Budget Office uh, scored it. So, um, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not an accountant. Uh, there may be some smoke and mirrors there that I, I couldn't explain to you, even if I thought that, even if I knew they were there. But uh, they say it's going to pay for itself. And, if it, and I think it won't, it, 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 if it does, if it pays for itself, it's going to be through better health care delivery and getting people, um, keep, you know, the best, the most cost-effective uh, way to keep health care costs under control is to keep people healthy and to find ways to prevent chronic conditions and getting people the health care they need at the appropriate time. So, you know, there are a lot of very hard-to-measure um, aspects to it that um, I, you know, if, if not this, what? I'm not sure we'd be able to control health care costs any better if we had a, a, um, a national top-down uh, one-size-fits-all system. I, I don't have faith that that would work either. And I, I just, I personally, uh, for me, it's, it's a moral obligation that as a country, we need to make sure that everyone has access to appropriate health care services early, not later, not in an emergency room, and getting, uh, getting the health care we need and the ability to pay for it. And this, may not be perfect, but at least it's a step in that direction. <laughs> nice to see some folks agree. That's great. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, hi. You were talking about um, a specific set of people that would not be poor enough or have a low, or they would be, <laughs> that would not drop qualify. through the cracks. Yeah, yeah, they like they wouldn't qualify for Medicaid, and Kansas isn't doing the Medicaid expansion. I think mm -hmm. is what you yes, said. Yes, that's correct. But they wouldn't have enough to really pay for, probably even, you know, afford the bronze level. It sounds like. So I mean, how is that? Is there yeah. anything that's well? Do you it's guys a problem. Know? Yeah. Yeah, it's a problem, and here's. Just to make it even worse, I'll, I'll really cheer you up now. Um, hospitals agreed to all of this because they, everybody was going to have coverage. So hospitals said, we'll support. The AMA supported because supposedly we're going to have people getting health care services appropriately, not just ending up in emergency rooms. So hospitals, uh, one other way of, of controlling, of bringing down the cost is that Hospitals today receive what's called a DISH payment, DSH, Disproportionate Share Hospital Payment for taking care of the uninsured who end up in their emergency rooms. That phases out over the next four years because presumably 
you don't need it anymore if everyone has, has care. Well, hospitals in Kansas, especially in rural Kansas, are very worried uh, about that payment going away if we don't find a way to um, eventually do the Medicaid expansion. I, I hope that, that we will do that. It, to me, it's just folly that we would send our tax dollars to Washington and they're going to go to states that are uh, doing the Medicaid expansion. And um, because, you know, it just doesn't, especially in Kansas where, where the uh, existing um, Medicaid eligibility is so low. But Missouri's worse. So they're 19%. So we're not as bad as Missouri. Yay. Um, I was just wondering what's going to happen to charitable care now that everyone has insurance? Well, first of all, <laughs> not everyone has, has insurance. So, yeah. Once, once everyone if gets we, insurance. If we can, if we can get, get it to that point. Well, um, one, of the, 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 uh, one of the navigator programs for Kansas, I said there were three. The one that got the largest grant for Kansas is the Kansas Associations for the Medically Underserved. And um, they're eager to help people. Uh, get enrolled. Um, our safety net clinics, for example, were um, never designed to be a, um, a permanent system for delivering health care. I think they'd like to work themselves out of, out of business. There'll always be, I, I think though, for many people, they'll, they'll still go to those safety net clinics, but the clinics will be able to um, get reimbursed for, for some of the care that is delivered. So it'll, it's going to really help with the um, the whole, uh, hopefully, I, I doubt that charity care will go away completely, but it, um, but the the clinics will will certainly benefit from from some of those folks that they've been taking care of actually having, um, if it's eventually if it's Medicaid having, because um, they can do Medicaid now, you take Medi uh, accept Medicaid reimbursement. So um, they'll probably always be a need. Some people may just pay the penalty. And, and not by the insurance. Oh, and by the way, I didn't mention how much the penalty is. It's $95 for the first year. So your premium may be 100 or so a month, but the penalty for not buying is only $95. Now, it does increase. That's just the first year. It increases to about 700 or 2.5% of your annual income. So it does, it does you know, gradually go up. But the, th but the point is, you're paying $95 as a penalty and you're getting nothing for it. And you still might, in fact, get sick and uh, not be able to pay for your health care services. So there's still going to be people out there that probably will roll the dice and hope they don't get sick. Yes, I, I want to uh, commend you for, your, uh, for what you're doing for this and uh, uh, agree uh, with the, I was one that applauded, uh, but I didn't actually applaud because I agreed because I would be for a, a, the single payer system that you gotcha. uh, that yeah. you oppose, and it's what Obama actually ran on, and then compromised by having a system that that was uh, now Massachusetts system, which people in Massachusetts like. It was Nixon's proposal, and it's even the Conservative Heritage Foundation's yeah. proposal to right. do it. Uh, but I'm interested in why it's being so demonized, uh, and I. You know, I see you're, you get informed as part of your yeah. or your logo, yeah. uh, but it seems like the problem is is uh, that this this uh, program, which is not, which is really uh, middle of the road, and which when Sibelius presented to this audience to the K-State audience a few years back, she got a standing ovation because it was so commonsensical, and people that hadn't thought about it much were convinced that it was just common sense. Well, um, I'm, you know, I'm, and, and thank you. I I'm hoping that as Word of mouth, as, as your neighbor signs, goes to the, uh, this marketplace and finds out what, what they're eligible for in terms of good comprehensive coverage and pr maybe some fairly significant uh, tax credit, may, the word will begin to spread. And uh, I, it's just unfortunate. There is an awful lot of misinformation well, out that's what there. I was, that's what I was kind of getting at. Is yeah. what, uh, I know being informed is good, but someone really has to attack the disinformation. I mean, we heard it here about the worry about the debt, all, all the scare tactics about doctors not you know, signing up for the program or dropping out of not accepting Medicare patients. That's not happening. Uh, we hear all this, this uh, real strong disinformation campaign being done. And I, you know, you're too nice to either call them on it or maybe I'm afraid <laughs> too Republican. <laughs> So well, that's that's what I well, guess. Well, that's my the first time I've been that's, called that, to Republican. That's my question. In a now, you know, with all with all due respect. <laughs> I know. 
understand. <laughs> uh, we are, we are how, how, many, how many statewide meetings are we holding? 10 or 12? Yeah. Uh, around the state, we're going to be in Hayes and Dodge City and Garden City and Wichita and Kansas City and Topeka and Johnson County and I'm here tonight. Uh, we're trying to get the word out. Um, we're, uh, and we're getting some, uh, finally getting some media attention. You know, people don't react until it's, it is on our doorstep. And so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we just, we think it's really important that we, that people do get the facts, that they get informed and make decisions for themselves. It, it is an opportunity for them and to get. I think get. we plotted because of your point about this was immoral. This is a moral basis that half a million people, almost half a million people in Kansas, don't have insurance. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to do anything about that. So. Yeah, well, we do. <laughs> and I think, um, I think it's important that we find coverage. We'll go on this side now. Um, I'm obviously a K-State student, like most of us here. And the goal of all K-State students, I would hope, is to get a great education here and go out and find a great job. That's what we're being prepared for and make lots of money. Mm -hmm. hopefully, or at least enough where we can support ourselves financially. The example that you gave of the family, they were kind of a lower income, so they're paying less. Um, I would hope that we would want to be in a higher bracket because we're spending so much on our education and working hard in this area. But the thing with the moral obligation, I agree, you know, I feel bad that not everybody can access health care. But it also comes to a point where I feel our government, people are relying on it so much that they don't have to work anymore, and that we're supporting them. And I feel like at this point, when people are relying on our government so much, there's no incentives for them to work, and only punishments for those of us who do work so hard. Well, that's a, you've made a lot of generalizations about um, who's, who's out there and who's, and who's going to benefit. The, the problem is, we are all paying right now a hidden tax. Most insurance companies tell us that 25, 25 to 30% of our insurance premium today is to help offset the cost of people who don't get insurance and end up in our emergency rooms. And, we're, and, and if we're going to bring the cost of health care down, we first have to get everyone covered so that they can get the wellness visits they need. Uh, I mean, health care... To me, is, is, um, it's, I'll go back to the moral obligation. It, to me, it's not a privilege, it's a right in this country to have access to health care services. But is a moral obligation something that we should set laws on? Well, we have, a, we have a lot of laws that don't let you speed because you might injure someone else. We don't, you have to buy auto insurance. That's not so that you can get your car fixed. That's so if you go out and injure someone, they can come to you and get your irresponsibility, not you, the person who injures someone <laughs> in a car accident. So car insurance is, is mandated because it's in the, in the public, it's part of the public good. So it kind of, it, it falls into that category. We all pay as a society when people don't, when people aren't healthy. But people who work more pay more for the same health care. Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, no. We've got some, some of the, some of the richest benefits go to some of the highest paid employees. Um, some of the, our, our major corporations in America today, as I said, 95% of them already provide very comprehensive, that would be more generous than what this essential health care health benefit package is. I applaud you. I want you to go out there and get that good job. I can tell you, when my kids graduated, from get you. Um, they, I, I was real concerned that they get a job and they get a job that had, that had good health benefits because um, it's, it, can, it can, you just never know. Today you're healthy, you could be not so healthy tomorrow. And, and then how are you going, if, without health insurance, it's going to be a burden on your family. Uh, it ultimately can cause people to be uh, unemployed because they can't get the health care they need they get sick, they can't get to work, they become unemployed. So the whole employment issue is also driven by uh, the need to, to have, people, have people be healthy. I, it's, um, you know, your, your comments are, are, are some we hear frequently. 
Um, and um, I guess we think it's in the public good to have safe drinking water, and we provide that through the general tax base at the local level. We think it's in the public good to have safe highways, and we provide that through the general tax base at the state and federal level. Uh, we provide fire protection because we think it's in the public good. That's paid for collectively by all of us. We provide uh, public schools because we think an educated workforce is, is important. We provide uh, police protection because it's in the public good. So those are all programs that we've determined benefit all of us and we all, we all help pay for it. And those that make more pay more for those programs. That's true. But it's sort of, that's the way a civilized society works. Yeah, it just takes away the incentives of having to work. How, uh, how would that, I don't understand how it would take well, away. When you have the health care and everything that you need, but you don't have to work, because a lot of people, granted, a lot of people need it, and that's what it's there for, the people that need it, but it's also not monitored probably as well as it should be, because a lot of people are living off of well, all we of have, those Well, we have an obligation to make sure that people have access to, to good jobs, and we have an obligation to make sure they don't take advantage of the system. Okay. I agree. Um, Bye. Well... I mean, in regards to what she said, I mean, she said she's a Kansas State University student, and we, a lot of us are, and we're attending a public university because we as a country value public education, but for some reason public health care is a lot more controversial. But my question is different. Um, I, it's my understanding... That was a good point, by the way. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll add that to my police and fire and... <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's my understanding that children can stay on their parents' health care until the age of 26. Yes. And I was just wondering, because I know that's an issue for some people, so I was just wondering how and why it's set up that way. Um, good question. Again, they were looking for some early, you know, this is Congress. They're trying to pass a law. They're, they know it can't be implemented quickly. That's, you know, it was almost four years ago now. So they wanted some early benefits. They looked at the um, who is most likely to be uninsured, and they knew a lot of younger folks were uninsured. Uh, some companies were um, already take, allow people to stay on their parents' policies up to the age of 23, uh, sometimes 25, so um, they, um, Congress decided, well, let's just say kids can stay on their parents' policies up to the age of 26. You don't have to be a dependent anymore. You had to have been at some point. But uh, you can even be married. Your spouse can't be on the other parent's policy. But, but it, uh, over 3 million uh, young people across the country have taken advantage of that. And it's actually the companies, it's fine for them because these are younger, healthier folks that are going back, that are ba going back on, and the parent still has to pay for um, keeping that child on. So, I mean, it's the, the in, in, in the case of an individual paying, um, having uh, coverage uh, versus a, an individual with children, it, it would cost a little more, but that's bringing some, some of those younger, healthier folks back into the pool. So it's actually been something that the companies uh, thought would be okay, and, and uh, it has been popular, um, and that will uh, continue to be out there. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it, because that was a point I should have made in this audience. Duh. <laughs> yes, sir. So I really liked the tobacco premium that they paid because I think that incentives really help people. Um, I was wondering, are there any other incentives that are in the care or act right now that, that uh, incentivize healthier behavior or lifestyle or diet? Well, um, uh, these accountable care, thanks, accountable care organizations uh, that, and we have, uh, we have a number of them that have already been certified across the country. And their whole goal is to deliver appropriate care and to, and to work to keep people healthy, to, to do the follow-up on people with diabetes, for example, to make sure they're, um, doing their, they're um, monitoring their weight, they're moder moder uh, monitoring their sugar and you know, all of the things that somebody with diabetes needs to worry about. So um, the, there's also a focus uh, on the law in pre with preventive services to encourage people to get good preventive services by uh, the law eliminated copays and deductibles. That was one of the early benefits. So there's no copay or deductible on a whole host of preventive screenings, mammograms, pap smears, prostate screens, um, immunizations. Um, so they're covered, 
but you don't have, there's no out-of-pocket expense for the person accessing those. And that's another way of creating an incentive for people to get those um, wellness exams and to discover things early. You know, breast cancer used to be a, almost a death sentence, and, and now with early screening, good early screening, people are, women are treated and, and, um, and if not cured, certainly it's in uh, remission to the point that they can go on and live a normal, relatively healthy life. So we know good early detection is, is uh, a, a strong uh, incentive, and, and the law recognizes that by eliminating copays and deductibles. Good question. Hi. I had a quick question about the dental coverage. Um, it says for pediatrics, dental coverage is like it's there in the basic mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. So does that mean adults' dental coverage is not covered? No, or? it's, yeah, it's, it is not, um, it's not one of the essential health benefits. It is for kids, but uh, people can still um, buy uh, dental coverage. Okay, and does that include up to the 26 marker for like children to be on their parents, I, or does that no, cut off I think at 18? It, I think the dental coverage goes to age, um, up to 19. 19. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm not positive on that. Good question. I'm not positive on that. But I, I think it, I don't believe it's um, the dental coverage goes up to age 26. I'm pretty sure it's for kids up, to, up through 18. Okay. Thanks. Well, thank you all very much. Great questions. Um, I encourage you to go out and look at our website, insureks.org and play with that calculator.